This is a subject very near and dear to me. When I became seriously involved in music production, I read tons and tons of material on the loudness war. Now is the time to make my contribution to the conversation in hopes of preventing the further ruination of music reproduction. The loudness wars are a push by engineers, producers, and musicians to get a louder recording than the next guy. This is a practice that has been going on since the days of vinyl, where the mastering engineers who could get the hottest signals onto records without causing the end user's needles to jump were paid big bucks. The thought process goes that the louder a record sounds over the radio, the more people will enjoy it and the more likely they are to buy it. The thing about vinyl is you can only make it so loud, so that type of loudness is nothing compared to today's squashed MP3s and CDs. A lot of people like to point to Oasis's What's the Story Morning Glory as the tipping point for the beginning of the modern loudness wars. Now, throughout this video, I've leveled out all the tracks and I'll show you what I've lowered this to so that it equals, over here you have K14, which is my mixing standard, and uh, it goes to zero, I'm sorry, mastering standard. And anything around zero to p positive four and negative four is good. So I've lowered all these tracks and this first track I've lowered six decibels. Intro sounds good. Today is gonna be the day that they're gonna throw it back to you. By now, you should have somehow realized what you gotta do. I don't believe that anybody feels the way I do about you now. That sounded good. It stayed within K14. So now I'm going to go further down here towards maybe a course, something where it's more filled up. It's got like a really squash sound to it. Now I'll compare this to their Rock and Roll Star, which is from their first album. Again, I did have to re reduce this only by five decibels compared to six, but still I did have to reduce it. But you'll see, if you look at the waveforms, there's a lot. There's space. All that gray is space for the track to breathe. If you zoom in, you can really see how these tracks compare. You see that? You can actually see it clipped, flattened out, and it doesn't go that high on this track, but this track still doesn't sound fantastic. I would probably attribute that to the recording um, not being as good, the recording studio not as being as good, but um, even even in this lesser quality version, the kick drum kicks more. Track just breathes a lot better, but um. Digital Look Ahead Brick Wall Limiting was now available around the mid 90s and that capability was used to its fullest extent. Music dynamics in these tracks as you heard were sacrificed in the name of getting a louder CD. The thing is dynamics are what makes music come alive. Without the quiet there can be no loud. Think about that. 
There needs to be a contrast. Instruments lose their punch when compressed. The effect is mostly noticeable in drums and bass. Crush dynamics lead to listener fatigue, worse MP3 compression, and ironically, an anemic sound over the radio. CD is a great format, but it's been tarnished by excessive digital processing. When you brick wall limit the life out of a mix, you end up smearing the music. And sure, it's louder, but at a huge cost. What's the story Morning Glory was bad, but not compared to what was to come? In 1999, the Red Hot Chili Peppers released Californication. It is one of the biggest offenders in the loudness war. That just sounds flat. Everything sort, sort of just smears together during the courses. Um, you can hear distortion going on. It's just nastiness. Now compare this track that I had to reduce seven decibels to their, 1990, not, to their 1991 release, Blood Sugar Sex Magic. This is Suck My Kiss. Now that track sounds quite amazing compared to Californication. The drums really breathe. You can see all this empty white space where dynamics can go. You know, it's still a loud CD. You do have to turn your volume up more, but man, does it come alive like music is supposed to. Um, unfortunately, the Red Hot Chili Peppers didn't learn their lesson. 12 years later, last year, they put out this album. Um, uh, hold on, I gotta un unsolo this. They put out this track. This is uh, their latest single as of this recording. It's called Brendan's Death Song. And it's from their album, I'm With You. And the producers, or Red Hot Chili Peppers, who's in, whoever's in charge of the final say-so, they still didn't learn their lesson. Listen to this track. I had to reduce this even more than Californications. This has reduced 10 decibels to match K K14. Beginning actually sounds pretty good. All right, now I'm going to start playing over here. So if you turn your volume up, turn it down now. Look at how this just becomes pretty much a solid rectangle. I'll zoom in and show you. It doesn't look, it doesn't, you know, get much better. And as a matter of fact, look, look at that waveform distortion. That, that is just, that's terrible. It, it really is sonically terrible and you're about to hear it. So again, get ready.
seriously, how can anybody listen to this at a record company, compare this to, you know, an album that was, was released in 1991 when technology wasn't as good as it is now? Listen to this track. How can this be released? Seriously. You know what? I don't have a good job. Please give me a job at the record company. I'll approve or disapprove. This would absolutely be disapproved. Alright, enough of that. Going back a little bit further in time, here's the original ACDC Back in Black CD release versus the remaster release of the song You Shook Me All Night Long. Notice I didn't have to reduce the volume of this track because it sounds good already. And you can see all the nice white space up top. It's white when I don't have it selected. <laughs> but yeah, all that white space up top. Listen to this track. It just breathes. Compare that to the remaster. I don't think this particular remaster sounds too bad. It is a little bit squashed, but for a remaster, it doesn't really sound... It's not that offensive compared to some remasters I've heard. But you can still hear the squash dynamics. I only had to lower the remastered track by about yeah negative 4.5 decibels. So not too bad compared to the tracks you've already heard. A favorite album of mine is Nirvana's Nevermind. Their hit song Smells Like Teen Spirit came under three remastering iterations over the years. Here's the original. Alright, now here's the remastered release from 2002. Sorry, I didn't mean to click off of that. Um, what I wanted to say, though, was you can hear it right off the bat. This remaster sounds duller. 
And I don't know if that's because of the way it was equalized or if it's from the reduction of transients. But regardless, it does sound duller. And as you can you know, see here, we've got transients that are going to the absolute peaks here. And then compared to this version, they don't go that far. Now, I believe the only transients that get knocked off um, are maybe, maybe the snare drums, and that's only right here, I believe. Yeah, and see, that's, that's about the only time this track clips. If you look at it, it's, it's definitely not like this track. All right, and finally we have the 2008 release from their Greatest Hits collection. It was a dual disc release. And interestingly enough, it's actually a little bit more dynamic than the original track. You can definitely see it right here. Um, these tracks right here, the little intro, are not as squashed as the ones right here. Although it, it definitely is squash compared to the original, but let's listen to it. Sounds a little bit brighter closer to the original. But to me, the original still kicks both of these masters' asses. But these two do come very, very close to each other, I will say that. And, you know, this one just being a little bit louder, but uh, sonically, they're pretty damn close. I still prefer to just turn my volume knob up, but that's just me. Rock music wasn't the only genre affected by the loudness war. Pop music also had many casualties along the way. This is from Ace of Bases, The Sign, released in 1993. kind of interesting that the track you know is a good I don't know maybe four decibels quieter than it could be at maximum and whoever mastered this decided to just drop the level <laughs> but the cool thing is at least on my systems whenever you turn the volume up and your if your subwoofer level is connected to your speaker system even just having the overall track quieter, even though it's semi hyper compressed, it still makes a big difference. Alright, next up we have, although it's not really officially a pop song, this is from um, Four Non Blondes. I think it's like their only CD they ever put out because they, they broke up after their first CD, if I recall correctly. And this is uh, from, this, this song's called What's Up.
I just really like this song. I'm not sure about the rest of the CD, but I'm 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 I believe the rest of the CD is as dynamic as this one. I would assume, and I just like it because it has a good dynamic range. As you can see, it started off up on this meter here, pretty low in the beginning of the song. You know, down at negative 30, and by the time it gets to the end, it's up at negative 12. We got the negative 10 there, so, you know, again, there is no loud without the quiet. So, going on up the 90s chart, we have a Mariah Carey single called, um, a fantasy, I believe, was the name of the song, and or sweet fantasy. And here we go. Interesting thing I've been noticing in the infancy of digital brick wall limiting, and I don't know if this is a effect of tape compression or that it was recorded to tape, but I would assume Four Non Blondes was, was also recorded to tape. Maybe it was recorded directly to digital. I don't know. It, it's right in that range where it could have been either or. And, um, but this, this track definitely doesn't sound as bright as four non-blondes, and I don't know if that's Brick Wall Limiting's artifact or not, but just take note of that. Still not too bad, but it, it is a little, it definitely is squashed. Now, going up way later in the next decade here is Beyonce's Single Ladies. I mean, it's got loud bass, but, you know, the, ir the irony of it is if they just would have mastered this track a little bit quieter, the bass equalization wouldn't have been, had to have been so tough. Um, but yeah. Alright, going down here. This is a Katy Perry song called Teenage Dream. The intro, you'll notice, has a lot of white space, so let's check it out.
I think it sounds better than single ladies, but it still has that dull sounding. Just it just doesn't sound as as nice and airy. I guess is a good word. You know, compared to this track. And compared to Ace of Base. That, that does still sound, that, that track does sound dull. Um, little surprising that uh, these newer digital tracks do have that dull sound to them. But I, I really do think a lot of it has to do with brick wall limiting. that squashness to it now here we have our final track for the pop section here and it's lmfao with party rock anthem So that part where it's squashed, um, once the kick comes in, you can really hear how nasty this track sounds. It's just very pumping sounding, which, you know, that can be used as a creative effect, but I typically don't like the way it, it makes speakers sound. Very fatiguing, especially if you're wearing headphones. I'll give them credit for being able to squash all that and still be able to sound decent. Let's just go to this last part here. So this part sounds better. It's a lot less squashed. It's not pumping as much. I, I, I do like this last part. So yeah, Loudness War is still going on with pop music. I don't think they really care. Unfortunately, the Loudness Wars have also affected the rap game. This first track is Coolio's Gangsta's Paradise. Yeah, the shadow of death. I take a look at my life and realize there's nothing left. Cause I've been blasting and laughing so long that even my mama thinks that my mind is gone. But I ain't never crossed a man that didn't deserve it. Me be treated like a punk, you know that's unheard of. You better watch how you're talking and where you're walking. Or you and your homies might be lying and chalk. I really hate the trip, but I gotta low. As they croak, I see myself. Not too bad. Let's check out, this is Notorious B.I.G.'s Hypnotize from 1997. By the way, Gangsta's Paradise, I believe, was a 1995 release, maybe 1994. Um, so again, this is Hypnotize by Notorious B.I.G.
Not too bad. One thing about rap compared to other genres, and actually pop kind of falls into this sometimes, is that rap typically does not have a lot of elements um, contrasting. Like with rock, you have uh, bass guitar, you have the kick drum, you have cymbals going on constantly. With rap, you have more sampled music that tends to work better. It blends together much better. Um, you have maybe a little bit of a sting or strings going on. You know, you got the hi-hats, kick, a snare, just and vocals. And you don't really have too much else going on uh, compared to acoustic music where it can turn nasty really, really fast. So uh, this is going to Eminem's 1999 release, My Name Is, from his debut uh, long play album, uh, the Eminem LP. So here we go. On my life, I was very deprived. I ain't had a woman in years. And my palms are too hairy to hide. Whoops. Clothes ripped like the Incredible Hulk. Uh, my name is... That, that's starting to sound flat. I, I like the amount of bass in there, but it, it's definitely starting to sound flat. Uh, you know, it's mixed mono. But um, I, I can only imagine what it would sound like if it was not as loud. I'm just going to say that. And now we're going to compare that release to his uh, 2003, maybe 2005. Let's see. what. Yeah, Without Me, I believe, was 2003. So let's check it out. Nope. impressed with this track as loud as it is it does have a lot of gaps in the audio I believe the loudness mostly comes from the bass range which can fool meters but uh, this track I actually I actually got to give it um give it a good rating it still manages to sound really good so Moving on. Now this is interesting. Earlier I told you about vinyl not being able to have such a squash sound. And this is a very interesting comparison. On the bottom, we have the vinyl release of the Foo Fighters Wasting Light album. Uh, this is Bridge Burning. On the top, we have the CD release. I think you can see the obvious difference. This top track looks like a rectangle. It's not as bad as the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but it's pretty damn close. On the bottom here, we have a lot more white space. It's good times. So let's check out the CD version first.
It's got a very flat sound to it, just like Californication. Um, just, just uh, it's ironic because this to me, uh, honestly, was probably the biggest disappointment out of all the tracks because the Foo Fighters took the time to record this album to tape, do everything old school, record to tape, mix to tape, everything involving sonic quality was good up until the CD master. And it's a damn shame because listen to the vinyl. And yeah, the vinyl, I didn't even have to re, you know do any reduction on it. It just peaked out at K14. So here we go. This is the vinyl um, that this came with the um, album when you buy it, 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 they give you a password for a website to download an MP3 version of the vinyl. So here we go. It sounds duller, like like the highs are lost, and you know that, that's a that's a thing with vinyl. Um, it's definitely pretty damn compressed, but nowhere near as bad as the CD version. And I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna go to this portion of the song. I think I prefer the vinyl version, for sure. Finally, we have Metallica. I'm a big fan of Metallica. Over the years, though, their releases have gotten worse and worse. Let's start with Seek and Destroy from their first album. <laughs> For a CD that came out in 1983 and didn't have a huge budget, that sounds pretty darn good. And now here's the remastered version of it. I'm not sure when this was released, but I had to reduce it by 4 decibels. And here's the result. <laughs> Yeah, that just, that definitely sounds flatter. Alright, down to more recent releases. This is Enter Sandman, which if you've seen my mix analysis video, 
you'll know that to me this is like the gold standard for metal sonically this this track this whole album is amazing to me and uh it's really, really between this album and Load and Reload, sonically, we're the best Metallica's put out so far. And uh, I, had, I only had to reduce it by two decibels. So let's see what's going on here. I honestly think that's about as loud as you can get without sonic compromise. Um, it might even be a little bit too loud, but it, it, it definitely rocks. And <laughs> compared to these next tracks, it blows them, it blows it away. Um, actually, I only have one other track to show you here, which is the day that ever comes. With their release of Death Magnetic in 2008, Metallica effectively won the Loudness War. But really, what did they win? Because this track sounds like shit. There's no other way to put it. I had to reduce it 11 decibels to make it sound even for K14. Uh, so here we go, without further ado. That's about as good as that track sounds. Let's go to the, the middle part here where it really sounds bad. This CD sounds so bad, so much like an amateur made it, that it made headlines across magazines and newspapers because fans were complaining about how bad it sounded. And just like with Red Hot Chili Peppers' album, a petition went around demanding a remix and a remaster, but to no avail. And I gotta tell you this, despite what Lars Despite what James and despite what Rick Rubin has to say, Death Magnetic is an absolute sonic disgrace and it should have never happened. To say this sounds okay, you must have lost your hearing, which is understandable from playing so many live shows, but really... Need I say more? Fortunately, ladies and gentlemen, 
There is hope. The same year Death Magnetic came out, Guns N' Roses put out a fantastic sounding album called Chinese Democracy. Mixed by Andy Wallace and mastered by Bob Ludwig, two of the greatest names in the game. This is what modern recordings should sound like with all the great gear that we have. Just take a listen. That sounds amazing. And, you know, it's so rare for a commercial release, especially of this magnitude, because this album took a long, long time to make. It cost a lot of money to make. And it came out quieter than the vast majority of new releases going on. So that's so unusual that Bob Ludwig actually wrote an article on Gateway Mastering's website, which I'll link to in the description below. But just, just so you know, there is hope still. And that's actually why I put this video out. Like I said, I'm trying to do my part to combat this terrible situation of a loss of dynamics in, in modern recording. Modern, really it's modern mastering, but Recording has its own issues as well, as I've already addressed in several videos. Um, just for the record, Chinese democracy has an average A-weighted loudness of negative 16 decibels RMS. Which, you know, compared to other releases, that's quiet, but on my home theater system, my volume level is still less than 9 o'clock at comfortable listening levels. And when I boost this album, it sounds absolutely fantastic. And it's a shame more recordings don't come out like this. Because we're living in a time where we have the highest fidelity gear available, but because of hyper compression, the final result is sonically compromised. And really, I want this loudness war to end sooner rather than later. So I want you to do your part by emailing record labels and by mastering your own music at reasonable levels. And if you don't know what reasonable levels are, I highly recommend reading up on Bob Katz's K system. It's a great start. It's what I use. It's what this meter over here has been the entire time. K14 is, I believe, what Bob recommends as not sonically compromised, but still loud. K12, he recommends for um, like radio commercial levels. However, what I usually do is if I have musicians who want louder mixes, K12, I tell them, is the absolute maximum. K14 is really when you, what you want to aim for, and K20 I do for wide dynamic ranges and also DVD releases. Anytime I do videos, 
that are going to end up on DVD, I aim for K20. But K14 is my music mastering reference. I usually mix at K to K20 standards, and my music sounds good. You know, even coming from a basement studio, it sounds really good. And if you want to read more about the Loudness Wars, check out the links in the description below. And I will see you in the next video. This has been Adam for RealHomeRecording.com.